you so much for joining us today. Um, today we're going to explore some of the stunning gems in the national park system, places largely unfamiliar to the general public, and uh, we'll cover some sites uh, from across the West and exploring lesser known but spectacular natural and historical parks that remain some of the National Park Service's best kept secrets. My name is Caroline Lochner, and I'm a Regional Program Manager with Western National Parks Association. We're a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service, and we support over 70 park sites in 12 states in the West. I'm so happy to be joined by David Cruz today of Loves Park, Illinois, who gave up a 25-year career in chemical engineering and biotechnology to pursue a lifelong passion for human and natural history by visiting all 419 National Park Service units, become one, becoming one of about 50 people known to do so in December of 2017. And during his quest, family and friends implored him to write about his park experiences and observations. David has presented on numerous park-related topics at parks, museums, and libraries from the East Coast to the Sonoran Desert. The first published narrative introducing all of the National Park Service units and national trails, the Centennial, a journey through America's national park system, was released in January of 2019, and he's currently working on books covering the National Park Service sites of the Midwest and hidden gems in America's national park system. So without further ado, thank you so much, David, and take it away. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I would like to uh, start by uh, giving a, a little bit deeper introduction to who I am. I think Carolyn summarized it very nicely. And, and then our topic today, which will be hidden gems of America's national park system, specifically in the West. Um, the second book that I will finish will be called Hidden Gems of America's National Park System. And this will focus on 50 parks within the park system that are mostly in the bottom half of the visitation statistics and recreational visits for the national park system. Uh, the National Park Service tracks about 300, well, tr they track 378 different locations. In some cases, they've combined units in the way that they're tracking visitation. Uh, but most of these are from the bottom half, and uh, quite a few of them have fewer than 100,000 visits visitors each year. Uh, as Carolyn said, my name is David Cruz, and uh, the friendly Thawaro there uh, to say hello. And uh, I have a lifelong passion for our park system and human and natural history. As Carolyn mentioned in the bio, it led me to pursue some of my passions or prioritize some of my passions over my corporate career. Uh, I just decided I wanted to do some, something else in the, in the years of active life that I had left uh, and took the opportunity to go exploring in our national park system. Uh, that led to the goal to visit all 419 units in our National Park Service. At the time that I finished, on the weekend of my 47th birthday in 2017, there were actually 417 units. And my final unit to visit was Reconstruction Era National Monument, now National Historical Park, in Beaufort, South Carolina. It was a new unit declared in January 2017, along with three others that were declared uh, nearly simultaneously, and uh, th thus I had never visited it as a park since it didn't exist when I was on the Carolina coast in earlier visits. Uh, the uh, a major part of my journey through our park system was uh, enabled and assisted by the wonderful people throughout the parks uh, in we're talking about National Park Service employees, the rangers, volunteers, uh, nonprofit association uh, employees and members, and other visitors as well, who went above and beyond to try to help me as I was trying to explore the system. Uh, I wanted to do something during the centennial year. Going into the two, 2016, I had 
made it to 318 parks after setting the original goal in August of 2012. I was still trying to make it to the last 100 parks I have yet, had yet to see, uh, but I knew I would visit a lot of parks during the centennial year, and I wanted to do something, some sort of project to say thank you, to give back to the park service uh, as a show of gratitude for all the help that I had gotten and the, uh, from the wonderful people throughout the park system. The, the idea of what to do became clear in August 2015 when I noticed that there was a large collection of lapel pins made for the Find Your Park and the Centennial promotions. Uh, they were largely promoted, or they, they were largely done at the behest of Western National Parks Association and Eastern National, uh, who represent 60% of the parks in the park system. And, uh, and together, along with about 20 units outside of those two associations, uh, they had pin sets made for their parks that totaled nearly 500 in number between the two sets combined, representing 248 MPS locations in 46 states and territories. So I set about, made it a task during 2016 to go around the country and collect complete sets of both of these promotional pin sets so that I could have them professionally framed, give them back to the park service as a traveling exhibit to go through the parks, and finally a permanent gift when they're done traveling as a way to say thank you. Or as I tell rangers around the country on behalf of their over 300 million devoted fans. Uh, this exhibit, uh, these pens are the only complete sets of these pens that exist anywhere. Uh, they are currently in their third year, or past three years on tour in the park system. And they're at their 15th park host, Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis, Missouri. While I was busy doing that project, which turned out to be a 20 month project to, to find all those pens, I visited all those sites and then some uh, throughout 2016. Um, I was still trying to see new units and then getting back to ones I had seen before to explore them in more depth or see things that I had missed on earlier visits. And in some cases, I was just trying to complete the project, uh, the pen project and and uh, refresh my stamps during the centennial year, passport stamps that is. Uh, before that year was out, I ended up traveling to 387 of the NPS units in 360 days. And again, 318 of those parks were places I had seen before and explored previously. So I, I wasn't trying to see the whole park on all those visits, but 76 were initial or first time visits uh, and I did take more time to try to explore the park in some depth, uh, at least as much as the time would allow with such a, such a year. Uh, but this year in the parks became my own personal celebration of the National Park Service Centennial in 2016. And uh, it created a, it slowly got a lot of notice from friends and family who, who started to insist that I sit down and, and write this story. So uh, I agreed when finally my mother asked and insisted, she said, you need to sit down and write the story. I said, yes, because it's, that's the right answer for mom. Uh, but I did a little research and learned that nobody had ever written a narrative or at least published a narrative that went through the entire national park sy system, all 400 plus units. And there's, uh, now there's just over 60 people that we know that have, have done it. And so it's such a small group, uh, nobody had ever put that kind of journey in print. And I thought, you know, there would be a utility to do this because there are a lot of people that will never be able to go to a lot of these places. And, and this would allow them to explore them to some degree or at least understand the diversity and the depth in the park system uh, through a story if they had an opportunity to read it. And so that's what I set about doing in 2017 and 2018, putting my experiences in the park system in print. And then uh, after a two year writing and editing process, this was the product of that. My first book, The Centennial, A Journey Through America's National Park System. Uh, while I was writing The Centennial, uh, I had it, opportunity and also the, the need to explore many of these parks in 
ways that I hadn't necessarily done during my visits because you know, all of a sudden I'm going to write about these places and I have to try to try, try to encapsulate them or summarize them in some way. And, and I did make note in the centennial of parks that I thought were just exceptional or extraordinary parks that uh, got my attention and as I said have a wow factor. And in all these cases, I did some preliminary reading or preparation for my visits. But in each case uh, of, of the type of parks I'm talking about, I wasn't prepared for what I was going to see. It was truly uh, phenomenal. Uh, I called these parks hidden gems of the park, park system in the Centennial. And I, had, I used three as examples of hidden gems and two of them that we'll talk about today. So we'll get to those in a minute. But uh, for this particular talk, uh, I chose a group, a subset within the 50 parks I highlight as hidden gems uh, that are in the Western United States. And half of these parks are partnered with Western National, including this one. Uh, this is a picture of the office or study at Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site in Concord, California. It's just a little ways east of Oakland, California. Um, I, there are certain different themes that emerge in the park system, and we all have different aspects in the parks that resonate with us. One of the, one of the aspects of the parks that really gets my attention and leaves an impression is the opportunity to explore places where genius ruled the day or where genius or inspiration was allowed to flourish. And there are many such sites, but that's why I highlight this particular park. Uh, Eugene O'Neill was an extremely gifted writer. Uh, he also, like a lot of creative artists, he had a bit of a tortured past. Uh, and and his, he won four Pulitzer Prizes for his plays during his lifetime and is the only American playwright to this day to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, only, only American playwright to win that prize for his last work, which was also his fourth Pulitzer Prize, A Long, Day, a Long Day's Journey into Night. It was a play that was autobiographical in nature, so personal to him that he had his wife keep it in a safe deposit box under the promise it would never be released during his lifetime. So those last two awards were posthumous. One of the things that makes this site extraordinary is the opportunity to tour the house and a ranger guided tour and to see his writing space. Uh, you go up into this, this area and it literally brings you into his life. The whole tour does that in stages to degrees. Uh, but you go up into this sacred writing space, which his wife Carlotta guarded uh, and didn't, wouldn't let anybody enter or interfere with his work. And you see uh, a lot about the man, his passion for the sea, uh, his writing uh, habits. Uh, he had a, a unique aspect as a person where as he got older and older, he started writing in a smaller and smaller font. And it got to the point in his last 10, 15 years, his font was so small the only person that could read it was Carlotta, who would transcribe it in, in, with a typewriter in, into typewritten notes. Well, uh, when he passed away, or when he wrote his last work, he was writing in a size two font. Anyway, they have examples of his writing, along with a lot of other things there, in his study, in his office area, where he did all this writing. And it's a quite, quite a remarkable place to see. It's also one of the least visited park units in the system. Another place, and a Western National location, that brings you into somebody's life and gives you a great deal of familiarity with who they were and, and their personality is Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park in Texas, in, in the hill country of Texas. Uh, it's divided between two locations, Johnson City, where his boyhood home was, and Stonewall, where his ranch was, which he, they called the Little White House during the Johnson presidency. And uh, politics aside, you know, regardless of what one thinks about Johnson and his presidency, this is a remarkable site. It's a remarkable site because of all the unique aspects of the site that, that give you 
a glimpse of Johnson's personality. Uh, there's, there's over, I believe there's over 40 folk telephones are in the high 30s in telephones throughout the house, including one in the bathroom. There's even a phone attached underneath the dining room table where he sat to eat meals. Uh, he had TVs arranged in, in his bedroom and in the living room or, or den where they would watch TV with three consoles so he could watch all three nightly networks and their night, the, the news on all three networks at the same time. If he had an issue with reporting or comments about him, any of the networks, he was known to pick up the phone and actually make a call <laughs> to one of the uh, network presidents to complain in person about uh, what they had said about him. Uh, he's quite a character. There's also some humorous aspects to LBJ's personality, and that comes across in why I chose this picture. This is from his office or study in, in uh, the west end of the Little White House, and he actually spent something like 170 days a year in this location, so it really was an alternative White House. It served as the president's office for, for quite, a, quite a bit of the year. Uh, these bills that you see behind the desk that are encased in glass are a, an especially interesting story. So uh, one of his lifelong political confidants, John Conley, who was governor of Texas, later became the secretary of treasury under in the Nixon administration for a time. And when he got into that post as a gift, to his long-term, lifelong friend or long-term time friend, LBJ, he had a sheet of money minted. There were $1 bills with LBJ's face on them in place of Washington. Um, he, he had them cut up, put in a stack and encased in glass as he told LBJ so he wouldn't spend them. <laughs> um, and apparently when he gave this gift to LBJ, uh, LBJ quit back to him, so I wasn't worth anything more than a $1 bill, huh? Um, but uh, it, it was actually a bit of a, a scandal, too, when it became known to the public because technically uh, Conley was counterfeiting. Uh, so there was another reason why he didn't want LBJ to spend the money he's given him. But uh, that's just one of the many stories and attributes, aspects of LBJ's presidency and life that people can explore at this site. Uh, this is shifting gears back into the natural side of things and another Western National Affiliated site. This is one of the main overviews people can access from the Park Road or Main Tour Road from Lovell, Wyoming in Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area. And anybody who's been to Bighorn Canyon has probably seen this same view. This is a panorama of the confluence of Devil's Canyon and Bighorn Canyon. And then you can see the the, the river snaking through this canyon. Uh, as remarkable as the sites are in this park, in this recre national recreation area, including uh, um, Indian encampments, sites where they, they uh, built camps for hundreds of years, uh, some of the ranches, historical ranches, there's four historical ranches on, in the, inside the park uh, that are in various stages of preservation and you can visit to see what, learn a little bit about life uh, by, uh, from some of the earliest uh, European based or European origin settlers. Um, then um, despite all that there is to see at, at the top level or at the rim level in the park, uh, one doesn't truly see this park sufficiently until you get down to water level. So there are boat tours that take you up to this confluence, take you up the river uh, where you can explore and see the depths of this canyon and see some of the stratification of the layers and geology within the canyon. It is a remarkable geological site as well as historical site. And there's a lot here to explore. It's, it's definitely something that you need a couple of days at a minimum to, to get a, a, a fair representation of the park, but a remarkable location. This is not a Western National Park, but it is a Western Park and, and one of the hidden gems. It actually has the highest visitation amongst all the parks I cho chose as hidden gems, but that's because it's close to San Francisco. 
It's not because it's extremely well known across the country. This is the Point Reyes Lighthouse at the western end of the Point Reyes Peninsula and Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, this is a truly remarkable park. It's fascinating for, for many reasons. But one of the reasons is this rock you see that uh, the peninsula, peninsula is made of is a, is a unique type of rock. It's a conglomerate type of rock. And it's not found in very many places. It's very distinctive. Well, where this peninsula sits now, about 30, 40 miles north of San Francisco on the California coast, there's no rock on the mainland that's anything like this rock that's on, that's, that, that, comes, that comprises the peninsula. But you can find its exact geological match on mainland California if you go 280 miles south to Malibu. So that tells geologists when this rock came up and was formed, this peninsula was contiguous with that piece of mainland California at Malibu. The story is, or the deal is, that this peninsula happens to sit on the very edge of the Pacific tectonic plate. And over millions of years, the plate, the movement of the continental plates, North American and Pacific against each other, has moved this peninsula north at an average one to two inches a year, but move this peninsula north almost 300 miles from the point where the rock was formed. Uh, the San Andreas Fault's midline, or the center of the fault, runs right along the base of Point Reyes Peninsula. And in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, this peninsula moved about 16 feet in less than a minute. They give you an idea of the intensity of that earthquake and why it devastated San Francisco as badly as it did. Uh, but this is, is quite a remarkable site, a very dynamic uh, site, and, and it represents a consistent theme throughout the parks, and, and, and that is change. All these places are places of change. They continue to evolve, even through our, our lifetimes, and will continue to do so into the future. Now, this is another Western National Park, and these pictures were taken on the Lehman Creek Trail, which is on the west side of the park centerpiece, Mount Wheeler, which is just a little bit over 13,000 feet in elevation, the, the summit of Mount Wheeler. Um, for those who haven't been to Great Basin, it's about 350 miles north, northeast of Las Vegas and um, not too far from the Utah state line, but in Nevada. And it primarily consists of Mount Wheeler and the shoulder peaks around Mount Wheeler, which are even more notable because it's like this 13,000 foot mountain in the middle of the Great Basin Desert. So you have pancake flat desert that stretches out from the park and the mountain, and it, it creates quite a, a memorable and, and uh, scenic panorama. As you climb up the mountain, you can look out across the desert flats and, and just see om seemingly forever. Uh, but I was there in late March of the centennial year, climbing the side of the mountain. And the reason I include this picture, well, this was a view of part of that desert panorama to the left as I was climbing the trail or near the bottom of the trail. Since it was late March, the top half of the mountain was still covered in snow. And the park road, likewise, was still closed to visitor traffic. So the only way to see the higher elevations was to hike them. So I was about three miles up this trail and over a mile under the snow and ice. When I took this picture, I put my camera back in my pocket. And as I rounded this corner that you see, the subtle turn that you see on to the right in the, in the trail, I came face to face with a mountain lion that was standing across this trail and blocking the trail. So I was up there all alone with no other humans anywhere close and a mountain lion heard me come in and decided it was going to say thou shalt not pass. And, uh, and so that was one of the more memorable experiences I had during the centennial journey. As you can tell, luckily the mountain lion decided not to eat me, but we did have a very tense few moments staring at each other. This is another Western National Park. This is the highest, highest 
cliff in the state of Colorado called the Painted Wall. It's over 2,600 feet high, and it sits along one side of the Gunnison River in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. Uh, this is this is one what I call in the Centennial one of the most scenic locations in all of North America. The Gunnison River drops so much in elevation from the Continental Divide through this area that it essentially knifed more or less straight down, uh, cutting through this rock and, and chiseling out this canyon. And the narrowness of the canyon and its steepness are what gave it the, the name Black Canyon, uh, since uh, the river is only all about 40 feet wide or so in some places, and the canyon narrows to less than 2,000 feet wide at its narrowest point. So there's not direct sunlight on the river except right around the noon hour or when the sun is more or less directly overhead, thus the name Black Canyon of the Gunnison. But for those who haven't had a chance to go into Colorado and see this park, you really have to take the opportunity. It is an extraordinary natural wonder. Now this is going out a little further west. We're not in Western National Parks now, but rather Pacific National Parks Association. This is a view looking down at the harbor of Pago Pago in American Samoa, the National Park of American Samoa. Uh, this is a remarkable park that is among the lesser visited mostly because it's so remote. It's the only park in our system that's in the Southern Hemisphere, it's south of the equator. Uh, so you have to fly to Hawaii under normal circumstances, not the current ones in the pandemic because it's almost impossible to get there. And one would have to go through two different quarantines in order to do it. So it's more or less off, off limits until we have some normalization of life again. But uh, one would fly to Honolulu and so travel to Hawaii, the most re remote major island chain in the world from, major, from a continent. And then you have to fly another five plus hours directly south of Honolulu to get to Pago Pago and American Samoa, which is just across the international date line from Western Samoa. So it's in the same group, the Samoan Islands, uh, but it's split into an American territory and then the country of Samoa. The National Park occupies the ridge line of Tuitoela, which is the main island in American Samoa, but also covers land or almost all the land on several other islands, outlying islands that are some distance away um, and to the east. But even the opportunity to go and explore the main island, go to Pago Pago, you can climb up onto the mountains of the ridge line of this island in a dense, lush, tropical jungle and you just see one incredible view of another of the ocean, of the village, and even get a better experience, and that's to meet the remarkable people in American Samoa, those wonderful people. I called the National Park of American Samoa perhaps the friendliest national park, and I, that's very high praise, but I think that they earn it. This is another Western park that I just couldn't stop staring when I first saw this view. This is the view from the north end of Lake Chelan and Lake Chelan National Recreation Area, part of North Cascades National Park Complex, which consists of three units, Ross Lake NRA, North Cascades National Park, and Lake Chelan NRA. This is the view when you reach the north end of Lake Chelan, the third deepest lake in the United States, and you're looking straight up the Stahican River Valley. This, this view up the valley goes right into the heart of North Cascades and North Cascades National Park. Uh, so this is, this is near the end of the Pacific Crest Trail for those who brave the 24, 2600 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. And if they're going south to north as most would do, they get to this point, they've only got about 100 miles to go. And, and they get this incredible scenery uh, taking the boat up into Lake Chelan and, and to, to, to Stahican. Uh, highly recommend spending a couple of days in this park if you ever get the opportunity. You basically have to take the boat up the lake and stay in the lodge, but the hiking and scenery in this uh, unit is exceptional by anybody's estimation. This is another location I call a hidden gem. 
uh, historical in nature, as you can see. But this is the front of reactor B in, Man in, in Hanford, or uh, Washington, part of Manhattan Project National Historical Park, which has locations in three states, Washington, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This particular location is the Washington location. This is the front of reactor B, which was the first reactor to make bomb grade radioactive material for the first atomic bomb. Actually, the material that went into the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima came from this reactor. And when you see the design of this reactor, how they put it together and, and learn a little bit more about its operation, it just makes it all the more remarkable they were able to pull this project off. They were, they were working without a net to a great degree and they were, they were covering new ground with almost every step they took in building, designing, building, and operating this reactor but you can go take a tour of Reactor B uh, through a local association, and uh, it's a park service location. Uh, it's well worth the time and effort to see this reactor. This is a place that's close to home, and maybe some will recognize it. Uh, this is one of the views that you get in if you go through the heart of Chiricahua National Monument. Uh, I, I thought of this this may have been the park that first brought the idea of a hidden gem firmly into my head uh, because I had read about Chiricahua before I ever visited and I was wholly unprepared for what I was gonna see. Most of you or many of you might know that this park is within a sky island that was created about 27 million years ago by a volcanic eruption near the US-Mexican border blew up all this ash and rock into the air, which landed where this park currently is over the millennia, the ash and loose rock washed away and left these columns of volcanic rock, uh, harder volcanic rock that were slower to erode. It left all these columns in place for us to see today and it includes spectacular views uh, this is a picture taken along the Heart of the Rocks Trail, a little over seven miles, one of the more popular trails in the park, one of the better trails I've hiked anywhere in the park system. And you get to see things like the Pinnacle Rock uh, that, that you're looking at right now, uh, one of the many rock features along this, this walk through the park, and specifically the Heart of the Rocks Trail. If you do one thing in Chiricahua, I highly recommend taking a day to do the Heart of the Rocks. That is an incredible experience. But very close to home. I'd probably spend half my time in Chiricahua if I was as close um, as some of you folks. It's a remarkable place. This is another park I identified as a hidden gem and sang its praises very loudly and one I'm gonna be returning to in, in a little over a week. I can't wait, it'll be my third visit to Colorado National Monument. This is one of the views looking out across this valley um, that, uh, that carries the Colorado River after its junction with the Gunnison, thus the Grand Junction, uh, out down into the Colorado Plateau. I guess you could consider this sort of the beginning of the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado Ma National Monument occupies the cliffs or plateau just to the south of Grand Junction. This plateau rose on a fault called the Redlands Fault, which picked up the land just to the south of the town. But as it did this very slowly, uh, water spilled off the plateau, formed all these box canyons in the face of the plateau, which created fins. Eventually those eroded away into some standing rock features like Independence Rock. But with the monument, you can drive up the park road and get a chance to explore the face of this plateau. And it is a remarkable park and experience. With so many great views. Uh, the geology is fascinating. I consider this park to be may maybe one of the great greatest examples of erosion and geology combined in our park system. And that's including the Grand Canyon. This one is a personal favorite of mine. Those cliffs you see off to the north, 80 to 100 miles away are the, called the Book Cliffs. 
and that forms the northern edge of, of the valley. Um, but this is a, a quite a remarkable place, highly recommend, and I can't wait to return. This is another Western hidden gem. This is a picture taken of me at the window in City of Rocks National Preserve in South Central Idaho. This is not that far from Hagerman's fossil beds, but it's our Minidoka National Historic Site, uh, but it really is sort of in the middle of nowhere. It was named by an early traveler on the California Trail, it was going overland in the wagon train, and saw this collection of large rocks sitting out in the middle of nowhere. And to them, it almost looked like a city. These rocks were so large and numerous in number in this one central location that they called it the City of Rocks, and that's how this place got its name. But it is literally an outdoor jungle gym for people who might like to explore and climb. A wonderful place for either the solo park traveler or a family to go and enjoy these features, uh, investigate all the nooks and crannies, and walk some of the trails. There are a lot of discoveries to be had at City of Rocks. This is another Western National location, Tomazal. National Memorial in El Paso. This was taken late in the day, so sorry, it's a little shaded. Should probably lighten up the picture. This is one of the original boundary markers for the U.S.-Mexican border at El Paso. I had no idea what Chamazal was until I visited the site. It is a fascinating story, but it all took place before I was born in 1970. Uh, this was resolved in the 1960s. But long story short, in the 1860s, starting then, the Rio Grande decided to change course in El Paso as it was passing through the town. And it moved from north to south, thereby, thereby transitioning a huge chunk of land that had been Mexican over to the US side. Now the, the Treaty of Guadalupe did have, Hidalgo did have provisions for how to handle a, a situation like this. Said the international boundary was along the deepest course or mid course of the deepest channel of the river, according to the time when the treaty was set. But that didn't stop everybody from arguing about this because all of a sudden you're talking about there's Mexican land on the north side of the Rio Grande. And how do you resolve this? It took them about a hundred years before they actually got together and created a lasting solution. But it was, it was very articulate and spoke to the very best of international relations. Both countries agreed to preserve part of the land that was affected by this change in the course of the river and make it into a national park. And Chamazal National Memorial is our park in honor of the resolution of this issue. This is another Western park. Uh, this is a picture of the incredible amphitheater at Cedar Breaks National Monument. It's one of the higher parks to get to in terms of elevation, certainly in the lower 48. The visitor center and main road for this park is pretty close to about, it's about 10,500 feet in elevation. So this park stays closed for a big chunk of the year. As soon as they start getting snow, it gets covered in snow and becomes completely inaccessible. They do allow people to ski into it and do some things with snowmobiles and and dog sledding for those who might be more adventurous. Uh, but for the most part, it's a summer park for people who are coming by car or foot. And uh, it's, a, it's a magnificent amphitheater on the western side of the plateau, which eventually leads well, 50 miles or so away to Bryce Canyon. I think of this park as a smaller version of Bryce Canyon facing in the opposite direction and at a little bit higher elevation. And that gives you a pretty good idea if you've seen Bryce of what you find at Cedar Breaks. It's a remarkable park to explore and not that well known and not as easily accessible as Bryce. This is going way out west, as far out west as you can go in our park system, all the way to Guam. This is one of the landing beaches, the northern landing beach on the island of Guam, which is part of War in the Pacific National Historical Park. This park protects the center of the battlefields for the World War II battles occurred beginning in July of 1944, 
when U.S. forces landed and retook the island of Guam from the Japanese forces, which attacked it shortly after they bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was only a small Navy force on the island of Guam when the Japanese attacked it on December 10th of 1941, and uh, they quickly capitulated. It was a few hundred guys. They couldn't defend themselves against any Japanese invasion force. But we took the island back and it was formally declared secured in August of 1944. Uh, this is a remarkable park to see. I mean, it would be a beautiful natural location just in its own right for that reason. But the history here really starts to get you into the history of island warfare in the Pacific theater of World War II, which can be a, 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 a very moving uh, piece of history. Well, it is a very moving piece of history. And if you go as far as Guam to see war in the Pacific National Historical Park, you might as well go a little bit further north. About 30 minute flight north of Guam is Saipan, which is an affiliated site in our park system. American Memorial Park is um, managed by the National Park Service and, and is, occupies a spot in the center of the island of Saipan. Uh, Saipan is a very notable island in the Pacific theater because it was the first island that American forces attacked and, and occupied that had been controlled by Japan or had been Japanese territory before the war. As a result, it was the first island attack by American forces that had a substantial Japanese civilian population before the war. There were about 35,000 Japanese civilians living on Saipan at the beginning of the war. And quite a few of them were still there to keep the island going and running uh, when American forces attacked it in 1944, shortly after they made substantial headway in Guam, a short distance south. This is a picture from the conclusion to those events on Saipan. The Japanese occupying force, the army, had told Japanese civilians living on the island of Saipan that if they were captured by American forces, they might be cannibalized, they'd be tortured to death. It was much more honorable to die in service to the emperor, even if they had to commit suicide. Thousands of them took that to heart. This is a picture from what was called Suicide Cliff, about two miles inland from the northern point of the, of the island, Marpai Point. Uh, some 8,000 Japanese civilians committed suicide by jumping off this cliff and the one at the seacoast on the north end called Bonsai Cliff. This became known as Suicide Cliff. Uh, very intense tragedy in World War II and reflective of the Japanese attitude of uh, of honor and service to their emperor. There are a lot of lighter stories in the park system. This comes from one of the parks I'm also going to be revisiting soon. I can't wait to see it again. Uh, but my first visit to Dinosaur National Monument occurred during the centennial. I walk into the Quarry Visitor Center near the Douglas or Carnegie Quarry, which is one of the finest late Jurassic period quarries ever found in the world. And uh, now these are the big dinosaurs. Uh, so this was quite a fine and, and, and historical uh, and famous site for paleontologists especially. But uh, I walk into the visitor center and I see in the shelves in the park store, there's a whole central display packed with plastic dinosaurs. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how many families go in here and end up leaving with a $10 plastic dinosaur, uh, just taking a note of my surroundings. So anyway, I end up exploring the quarry, get to the end of the quarry hall, uh, where a piece of the quarry has been left unmolested so visitors today can see what it looked like to the paleontologist who originally found it. It's quite something to see. Even the exhibit hall is a National Historic Landmark for its design. But I get to the end and there's this four foot femur sitting on end, presumably for the purpose of taking a picture like the one that you see in your screen. And I handed the ranger my camera and I said, okay, I give up. The park has defeated me. Take my picture with the bone. And I'm thinking as he's snapping this picture, I might buy my own $10 plastic dinosaur. 
This is a picture that made it into the Centennial from Craters of the Moon National Monument, another fantastic park uh, that uh, I actually, this picture made it in, as I said, into the book uh, with the caption, what comes out of a lava tube? Uh, in this case, it's my wife emerging from a lava tube. But uh, Craters of the Moon is, is a remarkable series of lava fields that have, are, that exist in southeastern Idaho from a 54 mile fissure in the earth called the Great Rift. And eruptions have occurred along this fissure at about 2,000 year, roughly 2,000 year intervals since about 15,000 years ago. Scientists believe that more volcanic activity will occur here. Uh, that's a fairly strongly held belief as I understand in the geological community. Uh, the last volcanic eruption or last eruptions that occurred at the Great Rift were about 2,000 years ago, actually over 2,000 years ago. So some future visitor to Craters of the Moon might get a lot more intense park visit than they planned on. And they might find something much more dangerous than my wife coming out of a lava tube. Although she's dangerous enough. This is another fantastic Western park. This is one of the many views that you get from the Island in the Sky in Canyonlands National Park in Southern, one of the big five in Southern Utah, but the least visited of the big five national parks in Southern Utah. And it's kind of remarkable that Canyonlands is the least visited because I think it's the most interesting and the most complex of those parks. Uh, Canyonlands is comprised of three major areas, this island in the sky, which is an elevated plateau, uh, a couple thousand feet above surrounding terrain. Then you have the maze and the needles south of the island in the sky, which lie on either side of the Colorado River, which in the middle of the park comes together with the Green River. And all these things are at decreasing levels of elevation. So you drop down from the island in the sky, and then you have the landscape where a lot of these rock features rise from. And then you go another thousand feet farther down and, and you have the rivers and, and the height, the current height of the rivers. So the water washing through the Colorado Plateau, Colorado Plateau has left these remarkable features throughout and Canyonlands is one of the most spectacular places to explore some of those features and the geology of the area. I think Canyonlands gets overshadowed a little bit because it's right next to Arches, unfortunately. Uh, this is another park going a little further north. Uh, this is a picture from the Painted Hills District of John Day Fossil Beds in the middle of Oregon. There are three different areas or subunits in John Day Fossil Beds. They're all fascinating. Even though this park is named after fossil beds, and that's a very interesting aspect of the park, just to see the natural features, the coloration of the rocks in, in John Day is well worth the time, just to see the landscape and the natural features. That alone makes this park more than worthwhile of a visit. Unfortunately, it's a little remote, so a lot of people aren't that familiar with it if they're not already from Central Oregon. And we're getting to the end here. This is uh, our newest national park is designated by Congress. Another Western National Park, White Sands, was a national monument, now National Park. Uh, and many of you are familiar with White Sands. It was changed in designation, as I just mentioned, to National Park earlier this year. Came our 62nd National Park is designated by Congress, but has been a unit in the park system for decades. Uh, White Sands is, is a very scenic location, but I think it's just remarkable to walk across these gypsum sand dunes, which is collected over the centuries from the rock that have come off of the nearby mountain range and flushed out to the, to the east. But you walk across these gypsum sand dunes. I love the gypsum dunes, not only because of their white color and their beauty, but also they hold together. They're, they collect a little more moisture than regular sand. So they hold together under your weight a lot better. So you can walk across the crest of these dunes and it doesn't collapse under your feet. So it's a little bit easier of a hike. You just don't want to be out in the middle of this park if a thunderstorm comes up over those mountains or it starts raining, because that is not a good place to be in inclement weather. This is the last park I wanted to cover today. 
This is Kalapapa National Historical Park on the north side of the island of Molokai in Hawaii. This is another Pacific National Parks Association affiliated park. Uh, but this park is one of the best representations in the system, which there are a number, where natural beauty, profound human tragedy, and extraordinary heroism all come together in one location. And they do so eloquently at Kolapapa. What you're looking at here are some of the highest sea cliffs in the world. They reach over 3,300 3, feet above the Pacific Ocean below. This is on the east side of the peninsula Kolapapa, which is a very small peninsula right up against these cliffs on the north side of Molokai. Because it backs up to these extremely high sea cliffs, it's a very isolated location in the islands. And it's for that reason that in the late 1860s, when the Hawaiian Islands suffered an outbreak of Hansen's disease, which we know better as leprosy, they chose this location as the place for a colony for people suffering from this disease. So anybody who had symptoms of leprosy in Hawaii was shipped off immediately to Kolapapa. They were never allowed to visit or see their family again. They were never allowed to leave the peninsula and nobody else could go to the peninsula to visit them. At the time they knew leprosy was contagious. They knew that some people did not catch it, but they did not know why. It wasn't until the 1940s that it was discovered that leprosy is caused by a bacteria and that at least a quarter of people have a natural immunity to this bacteria. Well, um, for those unfamiliar with leprosy, it's a debilitating disease and terminal, especially in the last couple of years as the disease progresses, people become incapable of taking care of themselves. Somebody had to help these people, uh, but to do so, was to potentially sacrifice your life because you might get this disease. Well, a Belgian priest named Father Damien de Vesters and a nun named Sister Marianne Cope decided that they would, they would do this very thing. And so moved by the plight of these people, they went out to Hawaii in the first couple of years of the colony's creation, and they started taking care of these patients. This would be a, a, a decision that Father Damien would pay for with his life. He actually contracted leprosy and died 16 years after he arrived on the islands. He died in 1889. Uh, Sister Marian Cope spent the last 35 years of her life in service to these patients, 31 of those years on the peninsula, the Kolapapa Peninsula. Both Father Damien and Sister Marianne were canonized by the Catholic Church in 2009 and 2012, respectively. Sister Mary Ann is now known as Sister Mary Ann, beloved mother of outcasts. And if there's two people after the apostles that deserve to be, uh, deserve sainthood, I don't know who they are. These are remarkable people. What a remarkable story. And that's a journey through some of the hidden gems that I highlight in Hidden Gems of America's National Park System. I'm happy to share these parks with you and maybe provide a glimpse of why I see them as so special. And I think a lot of other people uh, do likewise. Uh, information about the original journey, uh, exploration of the park system, you can find it centennialjourney.com. I share pictorial reviews and tours of, of many of the parks on the book's Facebook page, the Centennial. And uh, I highly recommend the resources in the National Park Travelers Club. Joining the National Park Travelers Club in March of 2014 revolutionized my park visitation, brought me into contact with park enthusiasts of every nature and stripe and greatly enhanced my ability to explore the park system and was in no small part a big reason why I was able to finish the goal of visiting all the parks only five years after I started. So, thank you. That's. Uh, my presentation, I went a little bit over an hour, but um, I don't know if you have any questions you want to ask. Thank you so much. That is so amazing. That last story um, about that park is just, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. So, um, and out of all of the parks that you, use, uh, you talked about, I've only been to two. And I am so happy that you spent a lot of time talking about Chiricahua National Monument. Um, I actually was very lucky that I was able to work at that park. Um, mm. 
Western National Parks Association. And I just really enjoyed my time and I love it so much. Um, so with that, uh, you know that I've only been to two of the, the parks that you uh, talked about. So what advice can you offer to somebody who would want to start on a national park journey? I would, um, I didn't, I'll, so I'll be totally candid uh, about my own experience, uh, which is the most honest way that I can answer the question. When I started, I thought I was well read in American history and geography and knew the, knew the states pretty well. And, and maybe I was uh, you know, above average in those things because I had spent my life reading, but I really didn't know very much at all about the park system. I didn't know a lot about these sites at all. Uh, I started visiting them by planning vacations around them and then adding them to work trips. And my first 18 months after setting the goal in August, 2012 were inefficient. I, I went back past a couple of parks because I didn't know they were there. So joining the, the park, the National Park Travels Club was a huge deal to me. All of a sudden, as far as we know, all the 60 plus people who've seen all the parks are all in the club. It's got about 2,600 members, but you can literally get in that community, uh, it's very low, it's like $10 to join. But um, uh, you can get in that community, ask almost any question you can think of about the parks and somebody will have an answer. And it's usually spot on accurate um, about how to do that. So that, or, that would be a strong recommend. Um, the book I wrote, The Centennial was actually, I wrote it as the, trying to create the book I wish I could have read before I started. I wish I could have read my way through the whole park system. So somebody would tell me, Chiricahua is one of the hidden gems in America's national park system. <laughs> Be ready when you go. And this is how it's created and why it's so remarkable. I would have loved to have had that kind of introduction. Uh, but there are other resources out there as well. Uh, and people know about the brochures and, and, you know, it's always a good idea to try to get a copy and read the brochure and look at the parks webpage. Those are a sort of minimum mandatory. And then there's a lot of good references if they're, if they're going to the 62 national parks, as it is in my Congress, a lot of great references for those in yeah, that subset. Thank you so much for mentioning the National Park Travelers Club. It is such a great way to get more information and the people are amazing and so knowledgeable. And um, so can you talk a little bit more just about like what the National Park Travelers Club is? Yes, so it started in 2004 formally. And originally it was a group of serious park enthusiasts that had gotten hooked on the Passport to Your National Parks stamping program. So for those unfamiliar, these are the dated passport stamps you can get in every national park. You can stamp in a passport book that, that uh, give you a, a, a memory, if you will, or kind of a dated stamp of that visit. Uh, now, as the program has grown, it started in, the, in 1986, I believe, uh, there's over 6,500 of those dated stamps around the country. In the 400 plus parks, the 52 or 54 national heritage areas, and 30 national trails, all along those trails, so this group of people was trying to find those stamps and there were only probably a thousand or two thousand at the time, but they were struggling to figure out where they all were because it's not always a hundred percent obvious where, where, where they might be. And so they pooled their resources and created a database that eventually became a master database, which is the only one that exists anywhere that has the current location of each one of these stamps in the country. And that's how it started. But at this point, it is a group with a lot of people who do not do any stamping. Uh, they might collect other things, they might do the junior ranger programs, or they might just take park entrance signs and just visit the parks. Uh, but it really is a, a dynamic collection of people who see the parks for different reasons and have different passions or collections around the parks. And, and there's a the website has a forum, which is really the heart of the, of the club. But the club has an annual convention where people get together and they do member meetups in parks around the country, or they will do again when we can once again 
get somewhere close to each other. Uh, and those are great resources for somebody who wants to get started in the park system. It was amazing. I had the opportunity to attend the conference last July. Yeah, in Flagstaff. In Flagstaff. So it was really just a great experience. So one last question for you. This one's a tough one and I bet you know which one it is. Maybe you have an answer, maybe you don't. What's your favorite park site? I can answer this quickly in three bullets. The first one is, as anybody says, you can't compare all these places really. It's, it, you know, there's no way to compare Gettysburg to Death Valley. Um, they're just too different. But uh, I answer that question by bullet one. Yellowstone National Park is in a class by itself. It's incomparable to anything else. You have half the world's thermal features in one spot. You have two thirds of the world's geysers. Uh, it, it, there's just too much there and the wildlife and every, the canyon, the waterfalls, everything makes that place just different than almost than really any place in the world, not just in our park system. So aside from that, I think it comes down to somebody's personal passions. What trips your trigger, if you will? And people have, I find them fascinating to hear what you know people say to this question. For me, I love old growth trees. I can't spend too much time around old growth trees. I can get lost and spend hours upon hours. Uh, so redwood is one of my favorites. I also love extraordinary desert landscapes. There's a delta for you. So Death Valley is another one of my favorites. Not in July or August, but uh, in January through March, absolutely. Then the third bullet is, I talk about the hidden gems. And I used to answer that by saying, I love these hidden gems that I've found, like Chiricahua, Colorado, Minuteman Missile. I didn't mention it in the talk. Uh, that, what an extraordinary park that is. I had almost, I'll tell you when you know something is, is special, when you, ha you think you have little interest in it going in and then you leave and your, your jaw's on the floor and you just are, you're almost in a daze. And that's what my, life, my visit was like when I saw Minuteman Missile National Historic Site crossing the Badlands in South Dakota. I had little interest in the Cold War history and to get a chance to go down into our nuclear arsenal and see where we controlled our nuclear, our ICBMs, and then now they have their permanent exhibits in the visitor center. You can go out and see a missile silo with a test missile still in it. Uh, what, what a fascinating piece of history. You have the added bonus for that, that in the exhibits now, they tell you the stories at the end where we came within about 15 minutes of the end of the world. That actually happened on six different occasions, at least six different occasions. And they were all mistakes. They're all accidents. You know, three on the Soviet side, three on the U.S. side. Uh, these are just the ones that got leaked to the public. We have no idea if there are others. So things like that, history like that, I think it helps, at least it helps me appreciate life even a little more. All the things out there. So whatever, whatever, whatever people find, I've heard, I've asked people about their hidden gems as well, which is an, a companion question. I get some incredible answers and, and sometimes it has to do with their experience. They go to a site and somehow it just clicks with them. Now it's almost like meeting your spouse, you know, you, you know, you're in love. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great way to end it. Yes, for sure. And we certainly love our national parks and <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time and doing this for us. And it was so educational just really fascinating and um, just makes us want to hit the road, right? <laughs> yep, you bet. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Thank it, Carolyn. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This yeah, is thanks, Julie.